Chapter 10, The Mask Drops. Hopefully you're all having a great day. Remember to subscribe. Not long after you leave, the Gorgescu's summer estate. Tristan leans his chin on his knuckles, staring moodily at the Dracovian countryside as his driver takes you back to the palace. I can't believe there's another illegitimate child. Juliana's diaries tucked away in your satchel, but the weight of her words fill the town car. Tristan, I know Juliana's revelation was... Glances cautiously at the driver, and you trail off. He presses a button and a privacy screen rolls down from the ceiling, shielding you in silence. Yes, I hope we can keep a revelation to ourselves until uh, I can figure out what to do. I'm not sure there's anything to do about it, right? We keep solving the case. If one of Queen Victoria's children isn't my father's, Glowy, Juliana was right. It changes everything. Tristan... Maybe this is why your mom is uptight. Because she suspects her reign is a hair's breadth away from crumbling and scandal. I'm not clear on the specifics, but if she's kept it a secret this long... She'd do everything in her power to maintain the illusion, including reinstating her firstborn as hair. He slide closer to him, taking his hand. His fingers gracefully grip yours. You really think you're the love child Juliana was talking about? Juliana mentioned the act for hair equality, or equity. To me, that suggests the illegitimate child is the hair. She said it could change things. Juliana didn't know which of you it was. Be that as it may, the imposter is likely not one of the younger ones. They'd have to kill a slew of thorns to even be considered. We have to be prepared for the possibility that, by law, I don't deserve the throne. Would it really matter that much to you? Yes. How can I lead my people knowing my rule is a lie? That I'm breaking our laws just by being on the throne. He touches Chin, making sure he's looking you in the eye. Hair or not, you will always be the king of my heart. We can roll out a red carpet, set up a throne room in the upper left atrium. You can decorate it however you want. He lets out a snort of laughter, his hands coming up to cradle your smiling cheeks. Please don't make me laugh in the middle of my crisis of heritage. It might be too much for my sanity to handle. Or it's the only thing that will stop you from losing your damn mind. That would be you, actually. So, no more sulking? You lean forward, kissing him on the lips. His mouth parts beneath yours, a leg hooking around your calf to draw you closer. Oh, fine. I suppose I can be seduced from my uh, mel melancholy. His hands are cautious and urgent on you, pushing you back into the seat. His thumbs stroke your jaw, your neck, your collarbone. And I must say, the emotional support is a turn-on. To think before I met you, I considered it merely a bonus. His fingers twist into your shirt, urgently tugging it up. You gasp as his nails gently rake your skin. You want to do this now? What about our audience? He glances meaningfully at the partition and he laughs. It's a royal grade partition, Chloe. We're virtually alone. You rest your hand on his chest, his eyes turning with fear behind the haze of lust. A gentle, tortured sound breaks free from his throat, somewhere between a moan and a sob. Please, I need you more than ever. I'll steam up the back seat. Yep, Mount Chickawawa, basically. You pull gently away from him, looking over at the screen, separating you from the driver. With our luck, I'll sit on some button and give your driver a private show. I wish I could say that you're being overly cautious, but my previous driver's exit interview precedes me. You smile and sit back against the door, pulling Tristan against your chest. Your hand strokes up and down his spine. You have me. You don't have to do anything to prove that. If I did, just know it would be several times over, preferably long ones. He rests a hand, 
rests against you, and his breathing slows, the panic soothed by your touch. You hold him all the way back to Draco's. As the car pulls into the driveway, the Queen's assistant fidgets nervously on the stairs, clearly awaiting your arrival. You and Tristan hesitantly emerge from the backseat. He lingers by the car door as if he, something might jump back in to escape. I cannot think of a time less prudent for a royal greeting party. It's like they can sense when we're making headway on the case. Oh, it's more generalized than that. My mother has an uncanny ability to summon me only when she can cause me the most grief. Maybe the assistant just has a message? It's unlikely. Our best shot at freedom is to simply ignore her. I think I'm avoiding your mother won't help. No, but it can make me feel strong and powerful and in control, however briefly. Lean on me for that. The assistant, tired of waiting, nearly stumbles down the stairs in her eagerness to usher you along. Prince Tristan, you've returned. The Queen will receive you in the gardens. This way, please. Can it wait? I have some very urgent business. I believe her exact words were, I want to ensure I'm informed the moment that the hare arrives. Please don't make this more difficult, Your Majesty. I'm starting to sweat through my shoulder pads. Tristan glances at you, shrugs, and then follows the assistant in the gardens beyond the palace walls. You follow the frazzled woman through the gardens. Oh boy, she looks very happy. Where have you been? You and I were supposed to leave to meet the Duke Ramsard an hour ago. Oh, that was today. I must have forgotten. We'll have to take the helicopter if we want any hope of arriving on time. And if I have no interest in spending the rest of my afternoon with a Cordonian boar. I knew it was only a matter of time before you threw one of your little tantrums. What's provoked at this time? Have I n not made the task of running a country exciting enough for you? I can't say you have. It mostly feels like a slow, rancid disease, adding an extra layer of grief to my life each day. If only we were so lucky. Tristan glowers his expression, mirroring his mother's perfectly, and looks away. Let's speed through this, shall we? You'll pout, I'll yell, you'll ignore me, I'll threaten to take away something you like, you'll give in. Don't presume to know me just because I share half of your DNA, mother. What on earth is that supposed to mean? Your Majesty, we know you have a secret. Queen glances at you, but it's, you've hit a nerve. There's no sign in it, her expression. Whatever gossip you've been listening to, Detective, I'd urge you to take it with a grain of salt. We leave in five minutes. If you choose not to accompany me, then Detective Rose and her associates can say goodbye to their accommodations. I'll be right behind you. There it is. The Queen fixes Tristan with a withering glare and exits the gardens. You stop Tristan as he moves to follow her. Are you gonna be okay? With a family like mine, okay generally means alive at the end of the day. Don't worry, Chloe. I'll see you tonight. Tristan squeezes your fingers, much too briefly, and follows his mother to the palace helipad with bowed sh shoulders. You return to the guest room you've been staying in, trying to shake the feeling someone is watching. You lock the door and toss your phone to the bed, flopping down alongside a slumbering Alice. Alice stretches and rolls against you, her heavy head resting on your shoulder. You scratch her fondly, suppressing a yawn. It's the perfect opportunity for a nap, but your mind won't stop buzzing. Someone in this family gave Juliana that bird whistle. You take out your phone and open up a message to Luke and Ruby. Are you two around? Is it urgent? I'm trying to impress Ruby with how good I am at buying her expensive cocktails. It's working! But we can come back if you need us, Chloe. You kids enjoy your date. 
already making moves to international PDA. PDA is a strong term. Later. Have fun. Hours tick by as you search the web for any sign of Nightingale Whistle. Scan articles, social media pages, press releases. Find nothing. You look up bleary eyed to see night has fallen. I guess it would have been too much to. too easy if one of them had a bird brooch or something. Alice sighs and responds, looking over at you with a huge, baleful eyes. You ruffle her ears and her stomach rumbles loudly in the following silence. I don't think anyone's bringing us dinner tonight, Alice. What do you say we go hunt for some? Alice eagerly pads behind you as you slip off the bed and back out into the corridor. After many wrong turns, you find the palace kitchen. It's immaculately clean and empty. I thought a palace kitchen would be more lively than this at dinner time. It's usually like this when the queen is away on her duties, changing the kingdom for the better and all that. Vasily sits on the countertop with a bowl of vibrantly colored sugar and crusted cereal balanced on his knees. Vasily, I didn't realize anyone would be down here. Seems like everyone's got plans tonight. Oh, they do. Mother's off with Tristan. Father usually takes the opportunity to take my mother to some vacant country village. You notice the shirt is untucked, his feet are bare, and this is the most authentic you've seen Vasily since you've met him. You look like you're off the clock yourself. You mean comfortable? Did you mean, did you think I wear all my wool sweaters to bed? You have a face that screams, I attend the opera for fun. Oh, if only. You might find Astrid at one tonight, however. All my siblings are off in four corners at Dracos tonight. Your stomach growls, Vasily glances up in surprise. Sorry to interrupt, I haven't gotten to eat yet. I'm afraid my parents t also took their cook, so we are in short supply tonight. All I can offer you is a bowl full of uh, cherry bombs. Hey, those are good. Fallout reference. He waggles a box of dangerously red cereal puffs in your direction. Burning the midnight oil without a snack. You eye him, trying to determine if he's questioning a sincere curiosity or something else. Well... The case has been pretty difficult. Every time I think we're closing in on something, your family throws me a loop. Yes, well, they've been doing that to me my whole life. Are they actively impeding your investigation or simply making your life very difficult? Depends on which sibling you're asking about. He chuckles and grabs an extra bowl. Making to pour you a bowl of cherry bombs, you reach out and grab his wrist. I'll pour my own, thanks. Poison me once, shame on the thorns. Poison me twice. For the record, I have nothing to do with Patrick's little prank. You didn't stop it, either. A salient point. Vasily passes the box of cereal to you with an impressed look. You find a bowl in the cabinet and village checking for razor blades. Vasily holds up a singular cherry bomb, motioning to Alice. Can she? She'd love you for it. Vasily lobs a cereal puff in the air, bouncing it off of Alice's nose. She gives her his feet an exuberant lick before darting off to locate him. <laughs> A remarkable dog. She missed. I mean, how she's so at home in the palace. Actually, you've both adapted to the chaos of Dracovian life admirably well. It's part of the job. This is no light praise, Chloe. I've seen Dracovian nobles melt down after spending a weekend here. And I probably would have, if it weren't for Tristan and Marjorette. I'd have shown up to all of your fancy events in New York rags if it wasn't for her. It's uh, Max. She may be the baby of the family, but she's the uh, one who'll make the most of herself. And she's been doing some of her best work on you. Oh, like, I just gave you two names, you know. Yes, I'm sure Tristan has done everything he can to prepare you for our family. But he's half out the door himself. Were you at the same coronation I was? Tristan accepted the throne. 
in name, perhaps, but not in heart. It's obvious to anyone who knows him well enough. Tristan is... Still getting used to the idea of being back here. Can you blame him? Tristan's been away for nearly a decade based on bogus charges, and barely any of you kept in touch with him. I didn't say I blame him. I know we... I know that I didn't help matters by abandoning him. But the Queen seemed to be done with him, and my life is a great deal easier than her when her wishes are abided by. So you picked the most convenient side and left your brother to fend for himself. It was selfish, but we thorns are selfish people. Tristan isn't selfish, and if he's decided he wants to be king, then he'll make a great one. Hmm. You'd know better than me after all these years. He's a better choice than Lydia or Astrid, at least. You conveniently left yourself out of that lineup. Why? I'm a bastard, Chloe. Speculating about what sort of king I'd make is, is rather pointless. What if the act for hair equity goes, sir? That's Sebastian's pet project, not mine. I don't possess the stamina for his sort of politicking and palm greasing. You shake a few more sherry bombs into your empty bowl, schooling your tone. Sound like your curiosity is purely intellectual. But you're the second oldest. Wouldn't the act passing affect you more than anyone? In theory, but I know better than to pin my future on the government's whims. Unlike Sebastian. Oh, Bass has never met an argument or lost a cause he didn't shy away from. What do you mean by lost cause? He hesitates, alarm flickering in his eyes, as though he's shared too much, you weigh your words carefully. You think the act won't pass? No, I don't. For all his embarrassment, people like Tristan, they always have. But this vote is for future generations as well, not just this one. Indeed, but people are short-sighted. Tristan was the heir when Bass, Juliana, and Nodja first brought the act to court. He's the heir now. He forms the bitch mark for the legitimate heir. Yet another motive to tarnish Tristan's reputation. So why is Sebastian pushing the act again now? Uh, best guess... He wanted Tristan to answer for Juliana's death. It's another thing Tristan won't take responsibility for. And because I'm Bass's favorite. Speaking of Juliana, your phone buzzes in your pocket, distracting you from your train of thought. You can check your messages. I, I won't consider it unforgivably rude. And you glance at the screen. It's a text from him. You angle your body, shielding the screen from Vasily. I've had an idea. Can you meet me at the Royal Docks? When? I'm here now. I'm there. You tuck your phone away and set your half-finished bowl of cherry bombs on the counter. Hmm. Off to do more gallivanting around Dracovia. We'll see. Thanks for dinner, Vizelli. Good hunting, detective. He whistles for Alice. He emerges from beneath the table, continually licking her chops. Come on, girl, dirt duty calls. Alice follows on your heels as you exit the kitchen, leaving Vasily alone with his cereal. It's still pitch black outside when you and Alice catch a cab across the city. You find Tristan standing alone at the edge of the water, staring pensively at a large yacht. You eye the yacht. You don't need to be a detective to understand the significance it holds for him. This is the yacht you and Juliana took out that night? It is. Tristan... Must be hard to be back here. Looking at the thing makes me hard to breathe. But... You owe it to her to find answers. And I've let myself get distracted, as I always do. It doesn't matter whether I'm my father's son or not. Of course it does. It matters to you. But not to the investigation. Not in any way that I can see. He takes a deep breath, pulling one hand to the ornate balustrade of the yacht's gangplank. But if Juliana was murdered the night when it's high time I re-examine what I remember, 
Maybe I saw or heard something that uh, can explain all of this, something I discounted at the time. Are you sure you're ready to do this? I am if you'll promise to hold my hand through it. He holds out his hand and you take it without hesitation. Every step of the way. He gives you a grateful smile and leads you up the gangplank. Tell me what happened when you and Juliana reached the yacht. Did you see anyone on the way? There was a guard on duty at the gate of the docks, but nobody else. Did they try to stop you? Not exactly. The guard was... His forehead wrinkles as he tries to recall the interaction. She looked worried. There was a storm coming. I think she noticed I was drunk, but she let us through. Why were you driving a boat? Juliana was the one piloting. I don't cheer and steer, Chloe. So she was sober. Did Juliana know how? She wasn't as experienced as I was, but she was still coastal nobility. We're all given sailing lessons the second week and see over the wheel. That's good, so the guards let you through, and he tugs pensively on a line of rope. An expression you can't quite read on his face. I secured the rigging while Julie took the wheel. We charted a course away from the incoming storm. Were you headed anywhere in, in particular? No. We just wanted to get away from everyone else for a while. We dropped anchor when we reached calm waters. And then? He looks to the door leading to the down into the ship's cabin. We went to bed. We follow Tristan down in the cabin. The windows are painted with a twinkling view of the night sky, giving the room a lavish and cozy look. This is the last place I saw her. You move through the cabin, assessing the space. There's only one entry point. You can still hear the lapping in the ocean outside. And you didn't wake up at all in the night. Not once. But the bed sheets on Julie's side were, weren't rumbled. There weren't any signs of a fight in the room. If she went on deck, she went willingly. That's why you believed it was an accident. It seemed like the only explanation until now. Someone must have called her up on deck. Yeah, but there was no one on the boat. Do you think she tried to wake you? If she tried to wake me she would have been succeeded. So she felt safe to face whoever it was alone. Something catches your eye, a pale stripe in the narrow gap between the nightstand and the wall. You reach in and tug it out. You rush a thick layer of dust from the edges and examine the book. It's battered, dog-eared, and clearly read dozens of times. That's Juliana. She was reading it that night. Why is it still here? Wouldn't it be considered evidence? As we've established, the guard didn't do the most thorough investigation. They must have missed the book. You see an underlined passage on a page of Juliana's book as you flip through it and stop, rifling back to find it. You can know someone your entire life and never see their true face until it's too late. You find the page corner Juliana folded over to mark her place only a few pages after the underlined quote. She underlined this the night she died. So you saw nothing strange on your way to the yacht and there were no sounds loud enough to wake you during the night. I'm afraid that's correct. This hasn't been remotely helpful, has it? We know Juliana thought she was coming back. Clearly she wasn't threatened by whoever lured her to the deck that night. She marked her place in the book, you see? Yes, and... We can see that... We're guessed that Nodge and Juliana were caught off guard by their attackers. Someone they didn't feel threatened by. But we don't know who. Maybe I'm not thinking far enough back. So let's walk it back then. Who else would Juliana have interacted with that night? 
Well, we were at Marjorie's debut fashion show. Nearly everyone was there. In the interrogation tape we played for the court, you said going out to the yacht was a spontaneous decision. It was romantic, but not in the way you think. She was upset. I wanted to be her knight in shining armor and whisk her away. But sometimes I worry I just sealed her fate. Tell me about that night. You take a seat beside him, putting a comforting hand on his knee. Take all the time you need. Tristan takes a shaking breath, his brows furrowed in concentration, and begins. Now playing as Tristan. Winter's fashion show was being held in a grand ballroom, hundreds of people in attendance, including the entire family. Bar Patrick, who was all the way filming something. Tristan, come play with us! It's been so very, very long. Sorry, ladies, I'm a, a reformed and respectable man now. I couldn't possibly do anything more than it with the two of you than drink copiously and reflect fondly on old times. Old times were last year, Tristan. Let me top your glass up, your highness. We can talk about making old times new again, perhaps with your lovely fiance. Countess Juliana would never. You'd be surprised. You're right, she's far too proper. My Julie is a fine, upstanding woman who would never do anything so salacious as agreeing to, uh, that. Four people is hardly... How many people is one? Hmm, sounds like a riddle. Why is it, uh, like a writing desk? You've lost me, your highness. I've lost myself, my dear, again. Now, <clears throat> have either of you seen my uh, love of my life recently? She wandered off somewhere, and there are too many people here to find her again. I saw her going out the east doors not too long ago. You'd better find her before the show starts. Or we'll have to steal you away. Noted. Until next time, ladies. I found Julie's. Just as the call came for everyone to take their seats for Marjorie's show. She was on the eastern staircase with Sebastian. Bass, please. I don't want to discuss this anymore. I'm so tired. You're tired. They're working day and night to keep the act alive. If we have any hope of bringing it before the court again. You bribe them. That isn't work, Bass. It's blackmail. Not everyone has a bleeding heart, Julie. You don't have a heart at all. Then how is it? You've broken it every day of my life. I didn't even stop to think about what they were saying. I stumbled in, grabbed Bass by the collar, pushed him against the wall. I slopped more than a little champagne down in his front in the process. Get away from my fiance. Sebastian raised his hand, stepping back, and dusted off his shirt with a sneer. And this is the king you're willing to throw everything away for? He stalked off and truly collapsed into my arms. She always hated being angry, especially with a friend. Thank you, my love. Has the show started yet? She was putting on a brave front, but I could see how bothered she was. Screw fashion, let's go on an adventure. We can't leave. marjorie has been preparing for this night for months. She'll be heartbroken if we leave. Motorhead is a teenager and going to be drowning in accolades. She won't even miss us. Besides, you're upset. Don't let me ruin your fun. I'll feel better in a minute. No, you'll pretend to and you'll be so damn good at it. Everyone will believe you. I took her hand, squeezed it tight. I wanted her to know how well I understood her. And I don't want you to pretend with me. It worked, I thought. She put her forehead to mine. I remember the tears caught in her eyelashes. I won't, honestly. The thought of chumming around with everyone makes me want to scream. Don't allow me to plan a daring escape. The royal yacht, it'll just be me, you, and the sea, and probably some seagulls. If we're truly sneaking off, you'll need to find someone to throw the press off our trail. Hmm, leave the details to me. 
I was so happy. I thought I'd done something good, something to help. I found Vasily and Astrid near the runway. I took a picture with him just to prove that I'd been there. The camera flashed, and I pulled my sibling close, speaking through my teeth. I need a favor. You know I don't do family favors. There's like nothing you could repay me with. If the next words out of your mouth are uh, cover for me. It's important. It's Mag's debut. She worked hard on this. Oh my god, this silly kid, chill out. I wouldn't be here if I had a date tonight either. You are both so terrible. I'll make it up to Max later, promise. Just say I'm trapezing about the building if anyone asks who I am, especially if the person is Mom or Lydia. And where are you going? Somewhere fun? Can I come? I'm taking Julie out on the yacht alone, very privately. Oh, never mind. Make sure you have the staff disinfect it when you get back. I have a big birthday plan that involve the Spanish cast of Bachelor in Paradise. Lord help us. Say what you will about my siblings, but they know how to lie, effectively. We made it to the docks and passed the guard, too. As soon as we were out on the water, we could finally relax. I set to the tes task of cheering her up. I reached for the captain's hat. But Juliana snatched it out of my hands, dangling it from her fingers as she settled into the captain's chair. I'll take that. What's mine is yours, after all. We're not married yet, Countess. What makes you think you can be the captain of this royal vessel? Well, given that I'm the only sober person on this taxpayer-funded vessel, I'm taking the helm. Fine. But only because you look cuter in it than I do. I disagree. Now I must insist that you wear it. Mm, too late. The hat's yours. And I'm quite enjoying the view. She looked so happy as she took the wheel and steered us out to sea. Can you secure the sails for me? I may be three sheets to the wind, but I can still use those sheets to harness the wind. Poetry, darling. We joked until we reached calm waters, well out of the way of the oncoming storm. But it was after midnight by the time we anchored, and I was losing steam. We dipped below deck, collapsing onto the bed. I was too tired to remove my clothing, and Julie only wanted to read. I curled up beside her as she cracked over the book. I was lying there while Julie stroked my back. Julie stopped to turn the pages of the book. Would you like me to read to you, my sleepy prince? Hmm, I suppose. This line feels especially poignant tonight. You can never know someone your entire life and never see their true face until it's too late. I politely opened one eye, trying to scrutinize her expression, but it was shuddered as usual. Still stewing over bass. You did your best for them. Some people are just born to be grimy little worms. I wish you were wrong. If she continued her thought, I, I didn't hear it. The last thing I remember is a gentle kiss on the cheek and the sound of turning pages. Now playing as Chloe, you run a hand over Tristan's back as he falls silent, trying to process all the information he's given you. You know that none of this was your fault, right? Perhaps if I had actually spoken to Juliana about Bass instead of mindlessly trying to cheer her up if I hadn't been so damned reckless. You're a different person now. Only thanks to you. Kristen takes Juliana's novel out of your hands. He flips to the page with the underlying passage, the same one she tried to read to him that night. You can know someone your entire life. It's Bass, isn't it? Everything points to him. It's all circumstantial right now, but yeah. Return to the palace in the dead of the night, stealing down the corridors, glancing over your shoulders. 
but you don't pass a soul on your way to the parlor near Tristan's suite. Tristan locks the door behind you, looking haggard. It's time, Tristan. We need to start thinking of Sebastian as our prime such a, a suspect. I always knew he was ruthless, but to kill Juliana... Bass has the strongest motive, Tristan. Juliana... I mean, she did turn her back on the hair equity. That's how Bass looks at her from the interaction Tristan described. And then also it does sound like she broke his heart as well. Hmm. People have done much more for far less. I've seen it happen more than once. Obsessive people confuse love with hate all the time. And this way he could hurt both of you. But how does this relate to Nadja? He didn't love her. We don't know for sure the two deaths are connected, but it seems like a big coincidence the two women who wronged him turned up dead in a way that reflects badly on you. But that's not what happened. The act never passed, and Lydia was ruled a ste in my steed. So Sebastian failed. And he'd need to try again with Nadja. He has the legislation back in front of court, and he'll have sympathy from Nadja's death once it becomes public knowledge. It all fits, but Bass has an alibi. He met with the representative uh, Mark Karov at the legislative building right around the time of her death. You hear the sort of laughter you interested in spring to your feet. To see Astrid's floppy hat pop up from over the back of a wing-back chair, the flames of the fire setting her smile face aglow. You've got one little detail wrong. Astrid. What did you hear? That you think poor unfortunate Bass is a cold-blooded murderer. Normally I jump to my brother's defense, but it's not looking very good for him, is it? Get to the point, Astrid. What's the detail we're missing? Bass wasn't at the courthouse that night. He was in the garden, here, at the palace. You and Tristan exchange a glance. It makes a dread and excitement churning in your stomach. You gather yourself for the next question. At what time? Oh, you already know, don't you? Just a hair after seven. All those objects in the picture just look so weird, don't they? they look like pieces of paper. Alright, without further ado, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Leave me a comment down below who... Let, let me know what you think. Who do you think? The whole nine yards. Um, I mean, if anything, we've learned that, you know, people will cover for one another, especially in this family. It is a royal family, nonetheless, right? That always does happen. Um, <clears throat> I do apologize about being late on this episode and, and you know, not uploading it yesterday. Um, unfortunately, I did have um, medical stuff to take care of, and by the time I got back, um, when it was a little late, right? Um, but everything kind of caught up with me, and so, yeah, at least I'm doing it today. So, without further ado, thanks for watching. Love your beautiful faces, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace.